Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam. I'm Alicia Downey. The 2023 annual spring meeting of the ABA Antitrust Law Section offered the Our Curious Amalgam team a chance to speak with competition law enforcers from around the world. We asked each of them to tell us about their enforcement priorities, what trends they see on the horizon, and what advocates can do to be more effective when appearing before their agency. As a bonus, we also got to know them a little better at a personal level. The title of today's episode is What's Happening in the EU? A conversation with DG Comp Director General Olivier Guersant at the 2023 Spring Meeting. In this episode, Matthew Hall asks Director General Guersant about the major issues and matters on the European Commission's agenda in the coming year. Some listeners may recall we published a previous interview with Director General Guersant at the 2022 Spring Meeting. On the webpage for this episode, you'll find a link back to that episode, number 165. Since recording this year's interview in late March 2023, the EU Digital Markets Act and EU Foreign Subsidies Regulation have both gone into effect. In addition, the revised final version of the horizontal guidelines, including coverage of sustainability agreements, has been adopted, along with revised block exemptions for research and development and specialization agreements. In the next half hour, We'll hear what Director General Guersant had to say about these and other recent and anticipated developments in the EU. Hello, I'm Matthew Hall, and I am with Olivier Guersant, the Director General for Competition of the European Commission, usually just known as DG Comp. DG Comp, based in Brussels, is, as our listeners will know, responsible for the European Commission's policies on competition and antitrust law. As such, it is the lead competition regulator in the EU. The Director General is the most senior permanent staff member within DG Comp, reporting directly to the Commissioner for Competition. Director General, welcome back to the Our Curious Amalgam podcast. Thank you. What is your organization's, the Commission's, top enforcement priority for the next year? Well, that's probably um, making our Digital Market Act work in reality. Um, you invited me last year, and that was already my top priority. But at that time, the top priority was to get it adopted by the legislator. And now we have to to make it work. We are we've been creating a structure to implement the, that text, um, a specific directorate. Uh, we are now in close contact with uh, firms that could be designated. I mean, the concept of the Digital Market Act is. Uh, that platforms that have power of a, what we call a core market uh, have a gatekeeper function. So this market controls the access to a, a multitude of other markets. Think about Windows for Microsoft, for example. If you want to access a PC with your app, you need to be able to plug into Windows. So if you control the market for Windows, you control or you have a gatekeeper function on a number of other things. Same for the search engine of Google, same for uh, uh, the social network of Meta, etc. And the DMA is about is about these uh, uh, platforms that uh, have a gatekeeper role on one or several what we call core platform services. That may be an app store, that may be a search engine, that may be a lot of things, and. um, the concept is, you know, we in the European Commission, we've been at the forefront of enforcement um, of uh, monopolization, as you would say in the States, in in the digital economy ever since Microsoft in the beginning of the, of the 2000s. And uh, what we saw is that time and time again, we have run, roughly speaking, 25 to 30 cases in, in 20 years. Uh, most of them have been confirmed by the court. And uh, when it was about platforms, it was always the same story. 
Uh, you have a core market. This market controls access to a number of others. And because you control access, either you use that power to, in an exploitative way, to try to extract rent from these uh, other players, uh, app stores. You set a 30, a 30% fee. Uh, why 30%? Because you can do it, because you're an unav- available trading partner. Uh, or you want to monopolize that other market. Example, price comparators. You put your own service at uh, at the top of the list. Uh, so it's a form of self-preferencing of your own downstream services. Uh, or many other things. Or you want simply to raise further the barriers to entry onto your core market because this is the source of your power. Um, so all these things we've seen and all the various ways of leveraging that power on the core market onto other markets over years. So the firms knew uh, we would not accept it. They knew it would be sanctioned. They knew we never so uh, never found any efficiencies that would you know, counterbalance the negative effect. And they knew the court had confirmed and confirmed again that uh, we were right to do it. And yet they were still doing it. And the question is, why? And uh, the only answer is in market economy is because it makes profit. And it, it, it makes profit because even if you're very fast, it takes you at least three years to bring a big antitrust case, in particular in the data economy. You have, you've floated with millions of data that you have to analyze. You, of course, defense lawyers use all the possibilities to slow you down. So it's three years, sometimes four, sometimes even five. But another characteristic of this sector is it's a sector with huge network effects. And in digital, these network effects uh, are even faster than in the traditional economy. Uh, and what that means is that if indeed the practice is as detrimental as we think it is, it is very effective. And in less than six months, usually, you have completely changed the market. The competing price comparators have disappeared, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you left three, four, five years later was only the possibility to, in, to to impose a very big fine. But visibly, this fine is never big enough to deter the the firms from doing it because it remains profitable long term because of the strength of this. So that's that's the DMA, and that's why it was important to have it because we have decided now to prohibit this this behaviors outright. So it's not competition law, it's a regulation, but it's an asymmetric regulation only towards these platforms that have a gatekeeper function on core platform services. And so that's really important for us that it works. And you will be continuing with your, you've referred several times to antitrust cases, 102 cases. You'll be continuing with those in types of cases in parallel with the... DNA. Yes, yes. Well, obviously, well, the regulation says that it's without prejudice to the application of Article 102 and 101. So we, we certainly can do it. Obviously, it would be a waste of resources to, 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 to run two parallel investigations on the very same thing. And we would most probably do it under the DMA because the DMA has been designed to be more quicker and more effective. Now, what you can think about is cases in which, because the violation is so important, you want to sanction the past. And with the DMA, you cannot sanction the past. You can sanction the violation. Because it's an ex-ante regime. Yes, it's an ex-ante regime indeed. So you you may think about it, uh, but that, that will be a transition issue because in Cruz regime, you have no past because they, by definition, they respect the DMA obligations. Um, so more likely it is that... Uh, Firms, you know, they will not be able to revert to their traditional behavior to profit maximize. And that was the core of the engine. I mean, a number of uh, platforms said openly in public debates that the DMA was getting at the core of their business strategy. So it is likely that they will try to find a replacement business strategy to try to, to maximize, continue to maximize their profits. So they will try to continue to leverage the uh, power through other means. So what I think is we will see other 
probably more is idiosyncratic to the data economy uh, because let's face it the practices so far were not terribly sophisticated it's bundling tying all sorts of leveraging that you've seen we've seen forever you've seen in other industries oh, in yes and for a very long time yeah so um i think we will see something quite more sophisticated because the data world allows you to do things that you that you couldn't do in the in the in the normal world aggregation of data gives you a sort of power that doesn't exist so we may see world. some new theories of harm to catch up with those types I, of activities i think so i think um they will be more innovative in their practices and we will have to innovate in our theories of harm and that will open a new more sophisticated field for uh, article 102 and probably also for similar regimes in other jurisdiction because well, let's see but it is not completely unlikely that firms decide to modify their strategy altogether a bit the way they did it to comply with GDPR uh, because it simply doesn't make sense to uh, segment. Yeah, they're worldwide companies, so they'll operate in yeah. the same way worldwide. And okay. other regulators will follow the commission, as they've done a lot in the past, of course. Well, I don't know if they follow, because... Or at least take a lead. Or, or but they, sure. they, for example, uh, with our US friends, um, they do not have a specific status for, for this, a DMA-like. They may have one day. There's a number of proposals on on the hill but with the current antitrust tools they can do a lot already uh, because basically everything we do on the DMA we could have done before except it was longer um, so what we have agreed together is we will cooperate so that we can have a consistent enforcement us with the DMA them with their antitrust tools and the first step to this cooperation is that we will welcome in May a colleague from DOJ and a colleague from the FTC, and they will be embedded within our teams in Brussels. Is that a first? It's not a first. Uh, we have had it in the 90s for major control. When we started a major control, the FTC sent the experienced colleagues and they helped us uh, put the thing together. But it's a long time it had not happened, yes. Back in 1989, 90, <laughs> when the yes, exactly. EU, ECMR, as it was, came into, yeah. into effect. Can I also ask you about probably another big area of your work, the foreign subsidies regulation. That's been pretty controversial. I know comments have been coming in to you on the implementing regulation companies yep. and trade associations are pretty worried, I think it's fair to say, about the amount of work that's going to be needed, both to calculate what the financial contributions are for the notification and then also for the actual notification itself. Can you comment on any thinking on in that? Are companies going to just have to put up with it? Well, I, it's a bit early to say that. I mean, we have put uh, for consultation a draft implementing reg. We have had um, a number, a high number of comments and a number of which as just as you said um, and we need now to review them and, and think a bit. I think what I can say at this stage is the following. Well, first of all, most of these companies complaining are European companies, which were all in favor of a very stringent regime, very strict, very burdensome, because they thought they would not be in scope. And also, of a sudden, they realized that, I mean, there is no such thing as this is a regulation for foreigners. This is a regulation for anybody who receives foreign, who receives subsidies, foreign subsidies, regardless of where you're located. Exactly. And uh, all of a sudden they realized, oh, gee, we receive a lot of foreign subsidies as well. So we're in scope. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, um, in, a, in a way, yes. Secondly, uh, you know, I'm in a position where I, I, I have a very good idea how difficult it is to, co to, to, to control state subsidies when they're given by our own member states within our jurisdiction. So the only thing, I guess, is that it's more complicated when the same subsidies are given by third country members, uh, states, which are not within your jurisdiction. Um, and so that means that if you do light, you're likely to do ineffective. Uh, because 
we will need to compel the companies to give you the information because we cannot compel a sovereign state outside of our jurisdiction. So it is bound not to be light in a way. So we'll we'll see what they say and we'll see what they uh, uh, propose and we'll see whether we can be a bit more imaginative. But off the cuff, it's difficult to see how you could ever be effective in tracking a significant foreign subsidy that actually deeply impact in a detrimental way the functioning of competition in the single market being light and if you're heavier you need to be heavier for everybody but I think the companies are concerned at least in part and the, the wide definition of financial contribution and the fact it would it captures things which are clearly not subsidies have no benefit to the to the companies because they're purely of acquisition or sale transactions. Isn't that one of the big concerns? Well, that we shall see. And, and if we can make the, the definition more fit for purpose, we'll, be, we'll do. Huh? But I'm not sure that will... It seems to me that they have wider concerns than this for the conversations that I have had with they them. They do, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and for me, uh, it's very, very binary. Um, if we accommodate their wish given that we cannot legally, and we have no intention, to have a double standard depending on the nationality of the company, um, we, will, we will be bound to either be relatively heavy or be ineffective. Moving on to our next question, um, what is the most important trend that you see developing in competition law enforcement in the near term? We've, of course, discussed digital but can yeah. you make some more general comments in that regard? Let's cover the, the digital. Maybe maybe turn a bit to merger control. I think it's interesting. Um, there, there are several things in merger control. Well, the the first thing that is quite idiosyncratic to, to the EU is this uh, rhetoric about European champions. And um, so we resist that because we... Well, what I say in conferences when I'm confronted to this in Europe, it's quite often that the question time people say, oh, but you, you're preventing European champions from, from emerging. And I'll tell them, well, listen, have you ever seen anybody winning the 100-meter race in the Olympics because he or she carefully avoided to meet competitors for the previous four years? Because I've never seen such thing. And I think in the economy, it's not very different. If you're not subjected to effective competition, you're less fit, you're less cost-effective, you're less innovative, and at the end of the day, you're less competitive. So the best way to have European champions is to have large companies that are cost-effective because they are subjected to effective competition on their home market. Secondly, the people that have promoted this model are promoted in a way a Chinese-like model. You know, so you grow your companies, lots of state subsidies, subsidies by the way, uh, in a closed environment in a domestic market, protected from the rest, and then when they're really big and strong, you unleash them on the world market. Well, one, as I said, I don't think that's the best way forward in general, but that's certainly not the best way forward in Europe, because... The Chinese model only works if it works on the premise that you are in a very centralized dirigist setting. And a kind of closed market as and well, which the market. EU is not. Well, none of this. Yeah. We're not centralized. Uh, we are actually not centralized at all. Uh, we need months of negotiation at 27 before we can make a, de a decision. That's not China. You know, as you know, as soon as somebody in Brussels decides something, it immediately aligns everywhere in Europe from Finland to Italy. No, of course. That's not the, the, the world we're in. And we are one of the biggest exporters in the world and one of the biggest importers. So how on earth could this work? So I think that's, that's the first challenge for us. And, um, but we certainly do not, do not intend to, 
to bend. The second one is the, the challenges ahead of us make innovation uh, the biggest and the most important parameter of competition. A lot more. It has always been, of course, important, but it's more important than ever. So, and that, that goes <clears throat> in all fields of uh, competition policy. Cartels. We see, of course, the good old price-fixing, market-sharing cartels, but what you see increasingly is cartels to slow down innovation, in particular in decarbonation. Uh, we have sanctioned, as you know, German cars manufacturer. We have an ongoing investigation in the circular economy because adaptation has a cost. It has a cost in innovation, and the longest you can delay this cost the better you are for your uh, profitability. But of course, the worse off the society. So that's, an, that's clearly an area in which it's important. Mergers also. And increasingly what you see, and it's not only a digital issue, is firms acquiring very small, very innovative firms. Because it may be, it's not even certain most of the time, that their innovation will disrupt their uh, their cash co uh, uh, at some point, and it's not necessarily that it's a killer acquisition. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes they simply incorporate it into their own service offer. But you have lost the benefit of the competition that have, would have otherwise uh, taken place, and as a result, the innovation is lessened for everybody. So you see it in mergers, you see it in cartels. Um, and conversely, in traditional antitrust, as you know, we have the possibility to give exemptions, comfort letters, positive decisions. We've never done so. And we've never done so because when we changed regime back in 2003, we didn't want to change a notification regime for a regime in which we would distribute comfort letters. Today, maybe, given the challenges ahead, it's time to change this because you may well imagine that companies cannot meet these challenges on their own. They need to team up. And this teaming up may involve some restrictions of competition, some higher costs, for example. But in return, you would have, say, a massive diminution of emissions. And I think this is something competition uh, policy should favor uh, if consumer welfare is better off uh, altogether. On that point, I know that there's been... There have been various draft guidance documents coming out from the Dutch, for example. Of course, the Commission has its own guidance on horizontal, including sustainability. The UK has recently produced guidance, of course, from outside the EU. Do you have any comments on the kind of criticism which is coming out of the Dutch on the too narrow approach in some areas on in um, uh, the fair benefits to consumers um, yeah. that have been made? I think it's a difficult issue. Um, and it's a difficult issue, and it's made more difficult by, um, how to say, uh, an approach that is that is not, in my view, the, really the right one. The, the core issue is, should you have a standard in which in-market consumers are fully compensated from the cost that the anti-competitive aspect of the conduct uh, involves by the benefits? Or is it sufficient that they have some compensation? Or actually, is it possible that they have no compensation, but there is a bigger societal benefits or other constituencies benefit? Whether that society is within the EU or even indeed worldwide? Whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's the core of the question. And the first thing, which is in my view, is we should get rid of if we want to have an educated debate, is this this concept of full compensation. Because it's not as if it was super scientific, you know. Uh, on the one hand, you may be able, with a lot of caveats, to calculate what, what is the harm to competition. Because, well, it's, if it's a price effect, you can calculate that relatively short term. Bon. It's not very precise, but you may have an approximation. But what is on the other side uh, of the balance is something is purely qualitative. 
you know, what is the price of a ton of carbon emission avoided? Well, you have a price, but it's probably more than that price. Uh, there are a lot of, number of positive externalities. So you compare this type of effect uh, with a straight uh, uh, raise in prices. And in a way, whether you're in the field of environmental efficiencies or in any other field, this is always what you do when you balance out uh, uh, in the frame of Article 101, Paragraph 3. So there is nothing scientific in this, in the end of the day. You, as an authority, and later on the judge, needs to believe that the consumers in market are adequately compensated for the harm they suffered. And there is a lot of value judgment in what adequately means. So there's nothing scientific in this. So in the end of the day, I think we should keep this uh, full compensation standard because the counterfactual is we may have, if we, if we get rid of it, a lot of greenwashing, which we'll not be able to, con to, to control. And my view is just equally bad. So let's keep the full compensation standard, but let's apply, apply it sensibly not as if it was something super precise that we can measure. And that, I think, will do the trick. If it doesn't, but I've never seen an agreement that was really anti-competitive, had really super beneficial effects that were really connected to the anti-competitive character of the agreement. Of the agreement. So if, this, uh, if such an, uh, an animal exists, and I'm presented with it, I'm happy to go beyond the guidelines. But I think as a matter of safety, I wouldn't like to go beyond what, where we are now. We give the right signal. If firms have something that uh, they think is really beneficial, they're very welcome to come in confidence and discuss with us. And if it goes over what we say in the guidelines, and it is really beneficial and really indispensable to have a restriction of competition for reaching the, the beneficial effects, we will clear it. And you may... Uh, and that may be an opportunity to take, a, uh, take um, use the informal guidance notice, which was um, yes. came out last year. So we're really out of time. So that's extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Um, last year we discussed your hobbies, and I know you were extremely keen on rugby. What is your prediction for the Rugby World Cup this year? I know it's being held in France. Do you think? Uh, I think it's time that France wins it. We never did. We went in final, I think, three times. Uh, so it's about time we win it at home. I hope so too. That would be mm. a great result. Yes. Thank you Thank very you. much, Director General, for coming in today. Thank you to Matthew and to Director General Guersant for a wide-ranging and engaging conversation. We have many other episodes featuring interviews with international competition enforcers, so check them out at www.ourcuriousamalgam.com and while you're at it, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alicia Downey. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at, at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.